Of esports podcast is sponsored by Esports Entertainment Group, a leading esports and online gambling company. For more information, go check them out at esportsentertainmentgroup.com. From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the Business of Esports podcast. I am Paul Dewalibi. I'm joined today by my friends and co host, William Collis, Jimmy Barada. For those of you who are new to the podcast, welcome to the official podcast of esports. What we do here is we cover the most pressing gaming and esports topics and news of the week. But we look at all of it through a business and C-suite lens. We dissect, we analyze the business implications of everything happening in this industry. For our regular listeners, thank you guys for tuning in every week. Thank you for all the love, the five-star ratings and reviews. Thank you if you have. I know you've heard me say this every single week now. Uh, if you haven't, go buy the book of esports. It's William's book. It's amazing. Uh, it's a must read. And if you haven't, go leave a review. Uh, so if you've read it, if you've bought it, if you've enjoyed it, go show William some love on Amazon. Also make sure guys to follow us everywhere. I, I know a lot of you listen to our content, uh, but maybe don't follow us on Instagram or on Facebook or on YouTube. It's all busy sports or business of esports, basically on every single platform. So go follow us there. How are you guys doing this week? Jimmy Barada, William, how are you guys doing? Awesome. Having great, yeah, yeah. Having a great week as usual. <laughs> are, are, did anyone did anyone play the new world beta no i didn't but i have a good reason why i wasn't playing new world beta but wait what what were you jimmy did you play it i have not gotten the chance yet but i think we should all hop on you know together maybe I, and, and see what's up with that i watched a ton of coverage it looks really good yeah. it's, it's actually not the worst idea because from what i saw you can have like factions and and do these raids together as factions and take over like uh forts as a faction basically and you if you own that fort and that territory you can then tax like the the people in the surrounding areas or um so i, I like the idea of uh would, would you would you conquest the and taxation the, the yeah, yeah, sports levy. The selling point. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the uh, first game ever where like i like the bullets on the back of the case you know it used to read like two player 40 hours to complete campaign paul's like where's the taxation <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad i didn't share first because in my mind i was like oh we could be like this cannibalistic fashion and do some really <laughs> dark things and uh, no no not not going there this is the business of esports <laughs> jimmy this is, this is about <laughs> taxation and profit here okay yeah we're gonna <laughs> It will be a prosperous but orderly society. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what, what was interesting is I, I, was, I didn't get to play it because I was too busy, even though I've been dying to try this game, dying for like a good new MMO, as you guys know. Okay. And, then, and then the night, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, like, when it came out, when it dropped, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to take 15 minutes. I'm going to go try this. And a friend of mine, I pinged him to see if he wanted to play. And he's like, oh, no, you can't play. Like, did you read this thing on Reddit? And there was this whole thing on Reddit about how the game was basically frying NVIDIA RTX 3090 cards, which Ooh. is the only card I run in all of my PCs. Uh, humble brag. Humble brag. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it meant I couldn't play the game. So I actually haven't tried it, which is kind of sad. I just don't want to brick ah. uh, a you know, pretty expensive piece of hardware. Um, but... It's weird. I find that's weird that, you know, you think Amazon, even though it's a closed beta and it's not a polished product, you would think at least they would have figured out in their testing internally that this is breaking GPUs. Like maybe, this is actually maybe maybe times are tough at Amazon Studios, you know, maybe like <laughs> the devs don't. There's no QA because yeah. to me, like, isn't that the most basic of QA? Maybe QA couldn't get a 3090. You know? like... <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um 
Anyways, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have, have other fun gaming stories from the week, but um, we do have a great guest today, an, an Ooh, amazing guest. Who's the guest? Uh, near and dear to, to my heart, uh, near and dear to the, to the business of esports and Holodeck, my business and the whole bit. Um, and it's none other than uh, Jimmy Mondal, who is, uh, as of yesterday, sort of officially announced the executive producer and host of all the content we're doing at Holodeck Media, Jimmy, welcome to the Business of Esports podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been a long time coming, but I'm happy to finally be here <laughs> and to uh, share this time and space with you all. And and so for fans of the Business of Esports, especially, they may have seen you on the live stream because you've made some appearances on the live stream. Uh, but this episode of the podcast is going to be all about you here, Jimmy. And, uh, <laughs> and I think it will be interesting uh, because I think, you know, there's a lot of people maybe who have seen you uh, around, you know, hosting things in esports and in gaming. But I think for our audience, it would be helpful if you could give them just some of your background, how you got into gaming, uh, why you got into gaming, you know, um, what some of the things you've done in the past are, because I think you have a really interesting kind of uh, trajectory of how you got to Holodeck here. And um, yeah, some of the some of the Jimmy Mondel story. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely been a uh, adventurous path, to say the least. There's been lots of ups and downs, but <clears throat> it all really started with my brother when I was younger. Um, he's 11 years older than myself, and so that is a lot of difference, right? Especially when you're developing as a child. So when he was a teenager, I was always a little kid that was hanging out behind him um, and just wanting to see whatever my brother was doing, right? Always, always, always. So. <clears throat> A lot of what he was doing back in the day was Dungeon Keeper and CS 1.6. Um, and so, you know, we had just like a crash Windows 98, like 95 or ME. I don't even remember what operating system it was. And um, I remember spending hours, hours, hours just playing games with my brother and my sister, um, even running through Diablo 2. That was one of the first games that we actually got to play as a, a family unit as a group me my sister and my brother my sister would be the sorceress my brother was the paladin and i'd be the barbarian running in first you know just dying over and over again but that's just kind of what you do right um so yeah way back when just started off with um first person shooters and then i really picked back up in like 2013 2012 with more counter-strike and um took it pretty seriously i found this passion for first person shooters and you know throughout high school and middle school just kept polishing it played a lot of condition zero um even offline just grinding this game for whatever reason i think just because deep in my mind it was like a childhood memory you know so it was a safe space i'd always go back to condition zero um and then when counter-strike global offensive came out i took it really seriously and um grinded that out pretty much to hit the highest rank in the game global elite um and at that point i was really considering competing for a long time um and because I wanted to compete so bad, I did. So I competed a lot in tier two tournaments. And through time, I, you know, ended up watching a lot of the tournaments that I played in, not only to review my VOD, but, you know, just to see myself on screen. I was like, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, and I realized over time that a lot of these commentators that were talking about Counter-Strike and Overwatch and these other games kind of just didn't know what they were talking about at all. I would listen to them and be like, you know, if you play soccer or if you play football and then you watch a football match, you know what to listen for in commentary. What are the important things? What are the things they're missing? And so I realized very early on that, wow, a lot of these commentators know really nothing about the game and they're just leading the audience on a wild goose chase and hoping for the best and just saying a lot without saying anything. Um, so I bet my friends that we could do it better. And so we did. We just formed a group and um, started casting Overwatch because that's when that game came out, probably 2015 or 2016, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and we wanted to be the first people in on it, right? You want to ride that first wave of esports hype to try and get into the leagues and get set up. We all know how Overwatch went. It took them over a year to get leagues set up, and then they nixed their entire Tier 2 and Tier 3 scene in one fell swoop and completely disabled and crippled their scene for the future five years but of course we can talk about that later but spent a lot of time commentating um worked my way to commentating at the microsoft store on fifth avenue where i was able to commentate to a live audience um got connected with mixer did lots of events out there and that was great and eventually i got scouted just by virtue of being in new york and being in commentary at the microsoft store got scouted by a production company working with frederator on their youtube content and spent over 
a year and a half, close to two years, working on building out the leaderboard, which is uh, Federator's prime YouTube um, channel, which has over 2 million subscribers at this point in time. And we pursued a passion project with eSports, which unfortunately fizzled out um, because of, you know, the space and understanding of the space was such so fetal at that stage, right? Like a couple of years ago, right now, everyone's really starting to understand esports and its grand scheme and where it can go and what it can be. But for a lot of time, it was the Wild West and people really had no idea what they were doing, but they were like, we want to be in games. And so they were in games. Um, but, you know, one experience led to another, ended up working with Quibi um, and Polygon after working on Cheddar Esports for about uh, a year and a half as well. And, you know, from doing live productions every single day with Cheddar Esports to working on short form content with Quibi and Polygon, now finding myself with Holodeck Media, doing all sorts of content all over the place. Um, but a lot of exciting things coming out in the next couple of months. So weird story for sure. Lots of ups and downs, lots of side trips. But um, here we are. Um, I'm curious, Jimmy, the, you know, the one, the one thing you mentioned was like being early, uh, with Overwatch and, uh, you know, I have this feeling that when a new game comes out, right. And I think this happened with Valorant and I think it's, you know, I'm already sensing it's going to happen with this new Ubisoft shooter game that they announced this week. Oh yeah. Like how important do you feel is being first? when it comes to wanting to be successful either as a competitor, a streamer, or a commentator? Because you've done all three, right? Like, how important is it to just to be on the game like on launch day or in beta or? It's ultimately it's paramount. Um, it is paramount. Um, when it comes to the slew of momentum that comes with being first, there is nothing that can be matched. If you miss one event, I'll give you an example. I was trying to commentate Valorant for quite some time, but I missed one event. And from that one event that I missed that other people were able to commentate, they got endless opportunities from. But I remember thinking, this is a catalytic event. Um, and when you're at the forefront, like really the thing is you're looking for connections and you're looking to make an impression very early on. Because if you're able to do two things, one, connect to companies that are producing these events, you're going to have an in for future events, be it a streamer, competitor, or a commentator, right? Whatever you're doing, you need to make those connections early on. Two, you need to just leave an impression. Whatever it is, if you have a brand in the way your voice sounds, if you have a brand in the way, like your style of commentary, your style of competition, your style of streaming, whatever it may be you're doing, you need to leave an impression quickly and you need to be on the scene immediately. That momentum will take you everywhere. And there is something to be said about people who come to the scene late and by virtue of grinding and working hard and just being present day after day and being consistent about it, that's another way to get into it. But much, 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 much harder, much harder. And you'll see now that's what exactly what happened with Valorant. A lot of these commentators were middling in Overwatch, but found that momentum early on in Valorant and were able to carry on that success. And of course, that is something we're going to see with Ubisoft's new shooter, which is slated to be 6v6, if I'm remembering correctly. And of course, people were going to try to commentate it. But my early impressions of the game are not great. You know, we can talk about that later, but I think that game's got a lot of work to be done. But do you find this is a trend that's getting worse? And when I say worse, I mean like it's becoming more important to be early or do you think there's going to be a reversal? And at some point, everyone's going to relax. There's enough opportunity for everybody. You don't need to jump on the game day one. Uh, or, or do you think this gets even more competitive? I genuinely believe it'll be like somewhat of an inverse bell curve, right? Like currently you need to get on the game immediately. You need to make that impression immediately. And I think it will get worse and worse until we see more competitors like Ubisoft putting out these titles that can be competitive shooters until there is not an oversaturation in the market of commentators. Currently, there's way too many commentators and way too little games. That's the hardest part of being a commentator, a content creator, and a streamer, right? You are trying to make it into that 1%. Yeah. Go ahead. But, but Jimmy, there's any question. I want to go back to the, the Ubisoft shooter that it sounds like you played and have some thoughts on, because I'm interested in like, partly you're saying it's important to be early to a title, but partly there seems to be like, you have to, you, there seems to be a quality evaluation you're making, which is like, is a title worth being early in? Exactly. In other words, like, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I could, what's a game that's launching? Like I could go early to the, re-release of you know the snickers promotional game and it's right. not going to do much how exactly. do you what do you look for in the quality of a game 
that makes you think this is something that's worth trying to be early at. Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's a couple of different ways you look at it too, right? If you're coming into it as a content creator per se, it, it's a very different set of standards that you're looking for if that it, than if you're coming as a commentator or competitor. If you're a commentator, what you're looking for is an established plan of action. And, you know, not to put Overwatch on blast, but I'm going to put Overwatch on blast. They had no sort of plan. Um, and so what the community did in lieu of a plan, and this is what's happened over time, over the course of history, because when games were released previously, esports is not the primary focus. They were focused on creating a multiplayer competitive experience, and the community is what came up in droves and created this esports ecosystem. We created ESL because we wanted to compete, right? All these tournament organizers appeared because players want to compete. Um, when Overwatch came out, that's what the community did. We were like, okay, you guys don't have a plan. We're going to come up with a plan. And we had this huge tier three and tier two scene blossoming with weekly tournaments, monthly tournaments, all through this ecosystem that was very established. It would have been great to integrate something like that, right? If, if, if you're a commentator, you look at what the community has brought to the game and you're like, okay, I can compensate these weeklies, I can compensate these monthlies, and I can see myself working up in terms of importance. But if there's no at plan of action, you're kind of lost. You don't know what to do. So when Overwatch came and completely blew up the Tier 3 and Tier 2 scene, that not only neutralizes all of your talent because they don't know where to go, they don't know how they're going to pay their bills, they don't know how, to, how they're going to do anything because they don't know what the future of the game looks like. And the same goes for a competitive player. A great game that is a a game that's a great example of doing it correctly, I think, is Rainbow Six Siege, right? They come out of, with the game, and it's not in a complete state. It's not great for the first two years. Two years later, they release a five-year plan detailing exactly how they're going to grow for the next five years. Hey, you guys can count on support from a developer's standpoint that we're not going to leave you high and dry, that you're going to be competing in this game, and we're going to listen to the community. We're going to work on it. That sort of commit, that sort of commitment from the company allows a commentator to take the dive and be like, I'm going to compensate this game. No matter what it is, I'm going to grind this game, and eventually it's going to work out because they've got a plan, and I can try to stick to it and try to, you know, make my milestones match theirs, and then somehow, you know, some way you guys will align. With the Overwatch strategy of just completely destroying your Tier 2 and 3, you put a lot of jobs and lives on risk, and it's like they're doing a similar thing now taking the team sizes from 6v6 to 5v5. You leave that other person out and their role is completely useless now. What do you do with these past five years that you spent with this game? You know what I mean? Like that sort of volatility is the last thing you want to see. So what did you looking for? If you're a commentator, if you're a player, if you're a streamer, is consistency from the developer, a track record of communication with the community, and a commitment to excellence in esports. And what that really means is just creating a product and being committed to understanding that, hey, might not be the greatest competitive game right now, but we're going to get there. That sort of commitment is really what I'm looking for before you can make that jump. So, I mean, I, if I'm going to jump in, but I'm just curious, like, do you think that in some sense, commitment is more important than quality, right? So in other words, like a lot of this, a lot of a sport is permanence, right? Like it's just there, right? And you, what you're talking about is like, I know it's going to be there next year, so I'm okay investing into it this year, right? Exactly. Like, and you know, you said Rainbow Six Siege wasn't maybe the greatest game at launch, but you know, you said five year plan confidence, and it, you know, you could see it turning into something excellent. Is that a lesson for developers, which is look like, don't be focused on where your game is now focused on if you securing the resources and believing in your original vision for the long term? Absolutely. And I think that's really key. And that's, I think, a fundamental difference of companies like Ubisoft and Activision Blizzard, right? Whereas Ubisoft was okay being that kind of middling tier three shooter for two or three years after launch. They were okay with that. But over time, being consistent, releasing quality updates, and just allowing the player base to know, hey, we're really not going to go anywhere, that allows you to, right, you gain respect on so many different levels um just and the same applies for being a streamer or a content creator or for being a commentator you need to just work at it it's not you're not going to be a great commentator off the start no one is a great commentator off the start if you guys listen to my commentary from 2015 you would laugh i was just awful um but you need to just do it do it every day and just get better and just by virtue of consistency and practicing you will 
get there on all fronts. Um, so I do think, yeah, consistency and just showing up, showing up every day with a smile on your face and just ready to work is just the hugest thing, especially in this space where it's so hard to get in, um, in a big way. It's very how, hard. How, how would you contrast that with the the publishers and the titles like maybe Fall Guys or Apex that were kind of the inverse, right? They actually had very strong starts and then maybe tapered off a little bit and were waiting, you know, Apex obviously recently coming back around full mm -hmm. circle, but uh, as opposed to what, what you had just shared with, you know, these other developers that are, you know, are in it to win it, patient for the long game. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just curious as to the inverse. Uh, Definitely, yeah. Voice. With yeah. a game like Apex, the reason I think it did so well is because of the other two things, right? When you look at track record, you have developers from Respawn who have created probably the most popular edition of Call of Duty ever, Modern Warfare 2, right? And that era of Modern Warfare, the most popular. And so, and I think when people come to their product, they know that they have that track record. And then when you get your hands on the final product as well, Apex plays unlike any other shooter on the market in terms of fluidity, motion, the way you have to think about the game. It's a very unique product. And so when you have something that feels like a passion product come from a company, which is what Apex felt like, I, I'm assuming for many people, because that's what it felt like for me, it felt like Respawn detached themselves from the corporate behemoths that you know were beholding them before and created this game uh, out of EA's ashes, it seems like, right? EA did not have a great track record, still don't have a great track record, but this was a win for them. Um, I think when it comes to something like Apex Legends specifically, yeah, you look at track record, you look at consistency, and then you get your hands on the game and you feel it and you're like, okay, this is made to be a competitive title. I can see this getting better just by the attention to detail, the attention to micro mechanics, the way the gun movement feels, the way the recoil feels like those things are competitively tuned and a game like Fall Guys per se, that's just something that's like, it's like a party game almost that has so that has legs because the barrier to access is so low you know what i mean so anyone can play it anyone can get it get in on it and anyone can understand that hey this is a lot of fun for a lot of people to play so it did it, that game was almost like a no-brainer when it came out but i feel like if you pitch that game to a lot of people they they wouldn't be a fan of it you know what i mean it's something that needs to be an execution something that needs to be experienced in a party setting or with a group of people to really make sense so for both those things i think it's a track record and two just feeling out the game what does it actually feel like when you're playing it and so i think where ubisoft has their work cut out for them is that end they might have the plan and the action for it will their game feel as good and so x i don't remember the x division xd x defiant defiant, x defiant yes yeah. Their game overall just feels really floaty. Um, the movement looks kind of jank. It looks kind of like COD Mobile. Uh, the recoil, not great on it. What I'm excited for is to see them improve. And maybe I'm completely wrong on those things because I got all that information just from watching a couple of videos. If they can improve on that and show their player base, hey, we're committed to making this feel good like they did with Siege, they're going to have a banger of product on their hands. Sorry, this is like a really, I might be going too deep here so you guys can be quiet, but I'm just curious, like I have, very, have a lot of trouble analyzing shooters in particular, right? Like, and I think maybe what you're saying is there's business implications to being able to pay attention to the quality of a product. You know, I'm just curious, can you give us a concrete example to listeners about like what you see in a video that lets you say, oh, the, that aiming is floating. Like, I'm yeah, just curious, I, like, just, just give, like, give me some, like, I'm, I'm bad at evaluating the quality of games. I'm not a shooter player. Like, you know, pretend that's like, give me like the 101, like I saw this. So I knew that this. Yeah, was gonna... right. So the most apparent way to cut, like make a decision like that and, you know, put together information to come to a conclusion is looking at one running. How does the movement of your. So if you're a first person shooter, your character's gun, how does it move while you run, right? Does it feel like there is weight to your character? Does the model of the gun feel like it has weight in your hands while you're running, while you're jumping? Does your character have weight? Do the motions your character make feel one-to-one -one with what you would be doing in real life? And the way, the best way to describe it is when you play something like Halo on PC and you feel somewhat floaty, like that floaty feeling that Halo inspires is because you're jumping, it's low gravity. That that fo floaty feeling you don't find in Call of Duty, right? You're very much on the ground and you're running around. And so 
those are two things that they went for specifically. Halo, obviously, because it's in space. Call of Duty, it's an on-the-ground shooter. When you have such specific niches carved out, you need to make sure that it feels like that, that it feels like you're running around on the ground, that it feels like you're jumping around in space. So where it gets lost in the sauce is where you're supposed to be running around on the ground, but if you jump, it feels like you're floating in space, you know? And it's just like, you need to maintain that sort of consistency where it's like, I'm playing a game. It needs to feel like I am the person running around. I am the one aiming this gun and sh shooting. Like if I move my mouse slightly to the left or slightly to the right, it corresponds with how I would envision my, like it, it's such a weird thing to talk about because it's like a, it's hard to put into words. Yeah. It really it's is. Like, it's like a, it, because it's I watched the, the same video. Right. And right. And you can tell conclusion and it, it's, it's, it just, it doesn't feel like a game where movement is a key part of the equation, right? Correct. Like where you you can the way you move, the way you control your character will 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 tilt the outcome of a fight. Right. And I think and Apex is kind of the extreme of that done well. And I would put CSGO because it's kind of an older game. Right. You know, maybe on the other end of, you know, not movement is is not, you know, maybe other and than it even comes down to like the, it even comes down to the specific gun, right? Like you're shooting a gun. How does the gun feel like when it's receiving recoil? Does it kick back a proper amount or does it kick back way too much or does it not kick back at all? And is it a laser? Those things play into realism and it doesn't even have to feel real as much as it has to feel consistent with the product. And I think that's the biggest thing here. Hi right, guys, I just want to get back to sort of more of a business topic here, which is, um, you know, the. I just want to go back to the question I had around you know, how crowded the space is. One of the questions I get most often from people is, hey, I want to be a, you know, big streamer or, you know, how, what should I do? Or, hey, I want to be a commentator. What should I do? And I mean, Jimmy, based on everything you've seen, is it like, are, are you of the mind now that all of these paths are just so crowded, right? You have 10 million people who want to be big streamers and there's really only at any one point in time, you know, 50 really big streamers making big money. Um, like, do you feel like the space is so crowded that there isn't opportunity for people to break in right now? Or is that like, would you encourage people or discourage people from the commentator path or the streamer path or I firmly believe, okay, so this is going to sound a little, um, like Disney, like, you know, like, yeah, you can just follow your dreams. You'll do anything like, um, but really it's the conviction that you have coming into it, right? Um, do you really want to do this or, or do you want the fame or do you want something else? Is that what you're aiming for? And so having that conversation with yourself is first and foremost. If you come to the conclusion that it's like, oh, wait, no, I actually enjoy this. That's the key. If you enjoy it and you enjoy your product and you just keep putting it out consistently, you will find success. And I guarantee you this because when even when I started, there was – Tons of people, Justin TV was blowing up, you know what I mean? And everyone was like, oh, the market's already saturated. I don't believe the market can ever really be saturated because I believe the consumer is out there for every sort of content. It's just up to you to be consistent enough in your brand to put that out there. And I don't even think that social media following has anything to do with it. I don't think you have to go out of your way to be completely someone else that you're not. I have a thousand... 300 followers on my Twitter. And I've been working in this industry for years at this point, finding work consistently. And I firmly believe that's because you come into this, um, if you want to be a streamer, a commentator, whatever it is. For myself, I found out that I wanted to be a commentator and I wanted to be a technical and analytical person, but that also could explain the game to a layman. And that was my brand. I understand the game. I'm credible. You know, I can kick your ass at the game probably. And I'm going to explain it to you in a way that makes sense. Um, and you're going to have fun while you're listening and watching to it. And so when you come up with a brand and you figure out, okay, what do I stand for? Just be consistent and you will find success. And I'm a firm believer of that. Like no matter what anyone says, like you can do it. So just really figure out what you're in it for. If you're in it for the fame at the end of it and you're just trying to figure out how to get clouded, how to get famous, chances are it's not going to work out because you're focusing on the wrong things. Focus on your product. What are you bringing to the scene? And how can you bring that in a consistent manner and still improve on the product? Uh, and I think that's really it. Like, you need to be offering something, um, be it personality, be it humor, be it charisma, be it information, be it 
whatever else. You need to be offering something consistently and you'll find success. Otherwise, good luck. But <laughs> I like if you want to get into the space, definitely, definitely have that conversation with yourself. My next question, Jimmy, is about cheddar. And, you know, we on the podcast once upon a time, and I, I got a lot of flack for this one. Um, we had a conversation around ESPN pulling out of esports, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again, just because, um, you know, I know I'll get flack again if I don't. But, you know, it, it was very unfortunate for the people who lost their jobs there. I know a lot of them landed on their feet in other places, which is great. But I think my comment at the time was ESPN just fundamentally didn't understand esports. Yes. Esports content they were putting out was not good. And um, it was sort of like inevitable that that was going to be how it ended. And, and I'm curious what you came away with as a learning from Cheddar, because Cheddar to me, you know, is a very like millennial brand. Right, very you think, um, a right? younger audience than ESPN for sure. Yeah. Right, um, you would think esports would have been kind of the perfect fit there. I guess I'm curious what, like, honestly, without making anything personal here, like just the business learnings you took away from Cheddar deciding to get out of that. Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, SEO is not everything. That is my biggest takeaway. Um, we made many a mistake because of SEO and. You know, because of the business side of it, like you think approaching esports like an equation will always lead you wrong. Um, it is not this plus this equals this many views. Never, never. Esports is a living and breathing community. And first and foremost, you have to gain the respect of the community. Once you have that, then you can really make any sort of content and they'll come and watch. They don't, they don't care. But if you try and approach it the other way, where you come in with this super high production value, claiming to be an esports show, but only hitting the most SEO and trending topics, you fail to communicate with your audience. What you instead become is a news source, which nobody needs, because if you're looking at the esports audience, where Gen Z were millennials, were a young audience, no one gets their news from video anymore, you know, not quickly at least. So if there's anything really important, if I'm, if I'm a gamer and I'm following news sources or if I'm following my favorite games, I'm going to find out from their Twitter accounts or their social media. I'm not going to go to Cheddar specifically. What I will go to Cheddar for is for the discussion that they have around those things, is for the personalities that they have, is for the community that I know that I can go and find every single day. And so really my biggest under, my biggest learning was that, yeah, SEO is not everything. It will get you more clicks, but clicks do not necessarily equate to quality and content. And quality and content although slow growing, more slow growing than approaching it through an SEO standard will give you a higher engagement rate on the viewer that's watching it. And they'll be engaged not only in views, they'll engage in the comments, they'll follow you on social, the quality of the viewer goes higher as well. And so and a successful story, um, I think that you can find is from, say, Tyler Erzberger, who went from ESPN and being one of their premier reporters, and now works at Upcomer where they've approached it completely differently, where they approach it with a quality standard in mind and come with the quantity later. And they found huge success already. Their YouTube is already racking tens of thousands of views, if not hundreds of thousands for the videos that they've been putting out. And um, their articles are well fleshed out. And I think even a stretch here, but I think a more complete example of what Upcomer is doing for esports is found in Polygon, where they've completely dived as deep as possible into gaming culture and explore the littlest things happening in these games, but find whimsy and find fun in sharing these tiny moments with people who have experienced those tiny moments because they're gamers too. They're moments you could have only experienced if you were playing that game as well. And so Polygon finds so much success because They've got personalities. They've got people that are talking about what they're passionate about, and they're engaging with their community in a way that makes sense. Their articles aren't SEO based. They do have PS5 articles coming out or like whatever the next trending thing is, but the bulk of their heavy hitting content and what they're known most for is for those pieces, which dive into the nittiest and grittiest of things that end up blowing up because people want to know that stuff. You know what I mean? Like people want to know that. Is it safe to conclude then based on like, I love the insight here. 
is it safe to conclude that big media companies therefore are likely to fail when it comes to gaming and esports content because they're always going to be looking at, you know, click through rates and, you know, as opposed to trying to trying to build for the long term, the community that, you know, you, you've, you've mentioned over and over that is necessary to success from a content perspective in the space. Like, are the big media companies somewhat doomed when it comes to gaming and esports content? Unless 100%. they fundamentally understand that community piece? A hundred percent. That's exactly what happened with Cheddar. Like not even to get into specifics, that's exactly what happened. We, after a year of um, doing the live show, we were at over 50,000 followers on Twitter organically. Um, that doesn't happen overnight, but that happened. 55, like 55, 58,000 over a year is pretty great growth for especially a da daily live over the top platform. Meaning we had found a chord in the community, we had struck it and we were resonating. But unfortunately, the the impact we were having on the community and the impact that our content was having and the eyes that it was reaching all across the community are not things you can factor in when you're looking at engagement rates. They're not things that you can factor in when you're looking at are, are things getting click-throughs, right? Are we trending on Google searches? It's like weighing the, the same metrics that bigger companies in media are using now are not the same metrics that are important for long-term success in esports. If you're looking to pump and dump, dump content and to prove a point to your own company that like, hey, we pumped and dumped a lot of content. It got zero views. We're going to pull out of esports. I think that's a great way to fail. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of companies do exactly that. Come in with a lot of money, a lot of production, zero heart and zero understanding of the community. And they're immediately written off by the community as being not genuine whatsoever. So why are we going to watch them? You know what I mean? And you try posting like something super corporate like that on Reddit, you get torn up but if you're understanding the community you're interacting with them where they live reddit twitter instagram you're going to those pages you become a bastion of the community and a pillar instead of a leech and that's like the view of you know someone who's in the community and seen this happen time and time again would you say that mixer um maybe was um you know did were they did they make the same mistake I'm I'm curious in your mind. Mixer, did it lack heart? Did it lack that? that Mixer focus on had community? heart, but it had nothing else. That was the problem. Mixer had heart. Um, Mixer had heart in its staff, in its streamers. They were in love with the product, but nobody was watching them. Um, twofold. One, the platform and the UX and the UI design was atrocious. <laughs> atrocious. How are you Microsoft and you come out with a product? Bad. It, oh my god it was disgusting um <laughs> it was gross the only thing they had running for them why would you use mixer right why would you go to mixer it was a poor twitch in every standard the only thing they had running for them is ftl right super low latency uh transmission meaning the interactions that were happening between you and the streamer were instantaneous they had that for a while before twitch did twitch now has it but you could stream why? snipe that much more effectively you could stream snipe that much more effectively <laughs> but on the inverse you could also Think of all the interactive and creative game show type content or, you know, so much other so many other things you could have done that they didn't run with. Um, why not tout that as your differentiating factor in competitive gameplay, in interacting with the community? And instead, why tout like they focus so much on the community without figuring out why they were important to be in the community. And I think that's where they failed. They only had this FTL thing going for them and the strength of their community. And then by the time Twitch got that, what else does Mixer have except for a bunch of subpar Xbox streamers? You know what I mean? Like where, where is the content? Where is the ingenuity in terms of developing content that's on the bleeding edge? If you've got this leading technology, let's use it in a way to create leading media, you know, like it, it seemed like a disconnect in terms of what they really wanted to achieve. And it seemed like, honestly, I'm not going to lie. It seemed like Microsoft wanted to get into live streaming and esports, and they found this like beam.io and they were like, yeah, these two kids look like they can do something. And then three years later, both these CEOs had left, left the company and they were like, okay, yeah, Microsoft's going to do whatever. One of them is doing laser shows and the other one's on boards for gaming companies or something. It's, they didn't seem to have 
a product that they believed in all the way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They weren't sure what was their standout point. They they weren't sure it was FTL, so they didn't commit. They weren't sure if it was the strength of their community, so they didn't commit on that end. And uh, the marketing, it, it, it was like a dating app. Come mingle on Mixer. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Do you remember those? Like, they they were all over the place. And it's just like, what? You don't? Like it was, it was just a massive disconnect. It seemed like on all ends. Um, and I think people were trying very hard to make it work and, you know, shout outs to them for trying as hard as they did, but I don't know, man. Well, I'm stealing one last question from Jimmy here. Uh, Jimmy B. Um, why did speed run not save Quibi? <laughs> 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 well, I think you're gonna have to ask Chrissy Teigen and Idris Elba and the every other star that had been paid a quarter or probably a million and a half dollars of the Katzenberg Fund. Um, there was a lot. I'm just, going I was on. just, I was just. No, no, I know, I know. There was just like so much going on there, man. And I really believe Qu Quibi and Speedrun, like. Speed One was a great product. Because it was a smart it was show, just, right? It was. It, was smart it really show. was. Genuinely, it was a smart show. The people working on it were great. The format was great. But the, the platform just wasn't there, man. The platform wasn't there. And um, yeah, I think in the long term, they were counting on something that just Didn't wasn't. Didn't materialize. Yeah, like the phone viewer, I don't think is your strength. And I don't think that's something you can bank on moving forward. But now we know, right? Now we have the tried and yep. tested and whatever, whatever the saying is. You know what I mean? Guys, I don't know if Jimmy, William, you have any other questions before yeah. we move on to some news here. I just want to touch. Please. I just want to yeah. touch a little bit on this because, you know, J Jimmy, M, you've spoken to innovation and heart, right? Uh, resilience, community and engagement didn't necessarily touch on monetization, but mm -hmm. w apart from the low hanging fruit, the twitches of the world, et cetera, I want to know who you think is doing it right. You know, we've talked a lot about other companies' failures and reasons we think behind those failures, but just the, the Jimmy M shortlist on, you know, who you like and for, for those reasons that you just uh, discounted the others. Absolutely. Yeah. I think understanding your community is biggest. So while I may not watch a lot of these content creators and media houses, they're doing well. And so one of the first ones that come to mind are someone like Optic or 100 Thieves, right? They understand Call of Duty. They were competitive players. They understand the mindset. They understand the types of shoes that these guys are buying. They are the brand through and through. So I, when I look at Optic and Hex, when I look at 100 Thieves and Nade Shot, I'm like, okay, these guys have heart. They understand their brand and they're monetizing on it in a way that isn't leachy, right? Here's some high quality luxury and hype beast wear for our hype beast audience. Who's not going to love that? And so I think they're doing a fantastic job in terms of like Valorant. I think Nerd Street Gaming is doing great content um, around the Valorant scene where they're like, okay, let us create a series for the tier three scene and for uh, the game changers, which are women and like people who haven't been really in the spotlight and in, in esports and gaming, which is pretty much everyone other than uh, males, really. Um, and so what they're doing is establishing themselves as the grassroots scene for the community and creating content around that. And they have a rabid fan base of people who will watch every one of their tournaments because they're well produced. They understand the community and they're speaking directly to them. And I think Valorant is also doing a great job of that overall. They have such a global audience because every they have multiple social media accounts for each and every region and they hand produce you know, curated content, like the Middle Eastern social media accounts for Valorant makes things about aunties and uncles, you know, and these like, they, they tap into brown culture because they understand we're a global game. We need to bring all these people together. So they talk directly to the audience and having people like Sal Garozo, Volcano, um, and people from the developer team talk about tick rate and frames and how the servers are impacting things. And having that really one-to-one -one communication shows that they understand their community is competitive first and foremost, but secondly, also really likes cosmetics and the aesthetic design of the game. So how do we tie these two things in hand in hand and develop, uh, deliver them a quality product? And Valorant just knocks it out of the park every single time. Um, so I, like these brands and these companies, I think really, really understand what they're doing um, and have found a lot of success because of it. William, Jimmy, I don't know if you have anything else. I, I, have, I have just one last sort of follow on on that before we get to some news here. Jimmy, do you think anyone's doing it better than Riot from both a competitive and casting perspective? Like, because you have good perspective on both of those. 
Is, is yeah. anyone really doing it better than Riot these days? No, um, no. Blizzard was a contender at one point in their lives, um, and that time has long gone. Um, as soon as they put Symmetra into the game as the only Indian character in that game, I was like, this company's cashed. Um, if I have to be tech support in another game, I'm done, bro. I am done. And I get she's an architect, but like, you really couldn't have given me like a dude with a Gatling gun that was Indian. Like, come on. Like, really? She has to be this super smart and like neurotic person. Like, you know, like just these little things where I'm just like, you're supposed to be portraying this ideal, optimistic world. You know what I mean? You get involved in Hong Kong. You don't put enough other characters in the game. Like it took you, they don't even have a black woman in the game. They have Anna, but it's like, what are you doing? Um, what's happening? You know, Sojourn was supposed to be the first black woman in the game. And it's just like, if you're trying to be this super, you know, happy, friendly, LGBTQ, positive future look at the world, make it that. Where's your other characters, man? Why do you keep firing people? Stop getting involved in international politics. What are you doing? You know what I mean? It's just like, huh? As a fan of Overwatch, I'm just sitting there like, this, this, this is the world that we're fighting for? Like, what? I mean, the bigger problem may be just they, they didn't do, add anything to the game. I don't it's know if it was over a purposeful year. omission or just they haven't added anything. Never mind. Right? It's just ridiculous. I, you're right. And when you talk about commitment and dedication, constant updates for the game or some sort of communication, man. Why did Jeff Kaplan get fired? You know, he didn't get fired per se. He left the company. Yeah. Jeff Kaplan, Tiggle, that guy with the legendary story behind his name who does fireplace talks with the community, you're going to get rid of him? Like that, I don't know, man. Ever since that you moment, think, I've you just think been we should like, have had is... the story. You think we should have got some, we should have had some explanation. Something for them to not mention such a huge figure. Overwatch and Jeff Kaplan are one in my mind. For them to not mention it at all signifies that something went down. I believe. I'm a believer that Jeff Kaplan tried to stand up for something that he believed in would have worked for the game. And ultimately he received so much backlash that he left. That is my understanding of it. And my belief, obviously I have no other information than you guys do on the situation. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, but that's my belief. He seems like a very passionate individual that wouldn't leave just for any other, any odd reason. Um, I love it. Let's jump into some news guys. Let's, um, I've got a couple of stories here that I think we should touch on. And the first one is, um, the headline here is Gaming Insiders Spooked by Pay for Engagement Plans. And the article goes on to talk about how uh, Google has announced that they're going to pay developers. This is related to Stadia. They're going to pay developers based on how much their games are played. Um, and, and the concern is that this engagement based payment is going to incentivize developers to make games that are either very long or that you have to log in every day to play um and basically the the way it's going to work according to this article and I, I think this was directly from google's announcement stadia isn't logging total hours instead it's looking at daily check-ins so if a player plays a game for two days they call that two months of engagement um, right. Assuming it's one is in one month, one is in the next month kind of thing. Um, and so it's not, you know, it's not just you're logging in and playing for 10 hours and therefore we're going to pay you more for the game. It's we're going to, we're going to reward people who just log in at all, uh, or check in at all. Who here thinks, um, and Jimmy, maybe start with you, Jimmy M start with you. Um, does this, what do you think happens to developers for Stadia here? Do you think that we actually end up seeing games that are longer or that are have incentives for people to check in more often? Or do you think people just revolt and say, hey, Google, we don't want to do this, right? We want to make the games we want to make. You're gonna, if you're going to play games like this, you know, forget about it. We're not going to develop for your platform. I, I'm curious, where, do you, where are you at on this one? I, I strongly believe, I mean, you know, we've seen so many games turn to games as a service, so it sort of makes sense in that regard. But even then, um, if I'm a game developer and I'm looking at this, like this sort of relationship between me and Stadia, I'd want to be paid up front for the product that I'm offering them because if I'm creating a product that's not meant to be played as a service, not meant to be logged in every day, you 
progress through this game, you know, chronologically. And then at some point you're done. If I'm creating a game like that, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm very, very much like, no, my game has a set amount of engagement, has a set amount of hours that you're going to play it. And then you're done. It's like watching a movie. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to be watching the movie every single day. I go to watch the movie. I watch it for two and a half hours and then I'm out. I have had the experience and that's what I've paid for. Um, I think if you're creating a game to be played as an experience, it's not something you're going to be a fan of. You are going to revolt and be like, hey, this really doesn't make any sort of sense. But if you're creating games as a service and the initial cost to create the game isn't overwhelming and can be mitigated, then maybe it makes sense to play it, to have it as an engagement play for a long-term strategy. But I think there's going to be a lot of uproar about this. William, where are you at on this? I know you this have interesting insight. This is, an, insight this is this. an extraordinarily bad idea. Like, it's just a bad <laughs> idea. And, and it's a bad idea for, like, just simple reasons. Like, what's the challenge with Stadia, right? Like, we all know platforms are dependent on good, exclusive, or original games, right? That's what drives platform adoption. If you're a developer and you hear that this is how you're going to be compensated for the game, are you more or less likely to develop for Stadia? I would argue that Basically, every developer out there is going to be, this is a less appealing monetization structure for them. It moves more risk over to them, right? And worse, it moves risk that seems like the metrics are weirdly calculated. So you could, like, I like how would a classic title like Undertale that you can beat in like, you know, two days perform on this? Like, it would look right. pretty bad, right? And that's Undertale, you know? So I think it, it has, you know, and then the thing is, it sort of seems to, be calling out a problem with the core platform, which is, I believe, an issue with Google Stadia as user adoption. So if it's already a platform that's short on users to drive to your game, why do you want to get paid on engagement per user, right? Like that seems like a problem Stadia needs to solve. If Stadia had 100 million users they were going to dump on my game, I would feel very differently about this. I'd say, okay, Stadia, that's a risk I'll take. You get 100 pe million people to play my game, I'll try to make it good enough that they come back month after month that I can work with. But all in, this just seems like a very odd decision that's going to inhibit quality on the platform. And, you know, I, 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 I don't know. It, it's, it, it just doesn't feel like this does not make me think Stadia is heading, trending in the right direction. I mean, guys, don't you feel like, though, it's totally logical from a Google standpoint, right? Put yourself in the Google executive shoes and they're going... We sell a subscription product. Well, we might as well pay people if they check in every month and continue paying their subscription. You know what I mean? Like we we want we they have William. You're right, an adoption problem, but they also have a retention problem. Yeah, right? yeah. But again, forcing uh, forcing the retention problem off into game devs feels a little, yeah. little right. like you know <laughs> disingenuous. But also like games. This this is a fundamental problem, right? Like. Games aren't like YouTube videos where maybe this monetization scheme works. Like I think YouTube, because a really good video that a creator pours their time into a regular content creator, 20 hours, 30 hours, 40, it, a good game is years. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So the scale is different and the YouTube model is already very controversial amongst creators, right? Porting that over to games again, it just I, th again this this reads very differently if you are a if you are a massively successful platform with tons of users to dump on this. That feels then this model feels fair to me. It feels like a publisher saying we will get a lot of people to play the game, but you have to commit that the game is good enough to keep them coming back because our people are on subscription, so we need you to be making subscription games. That seems fair, but this is that this is only the second part of the promise. We're on a subscription model. We need you to make subscription games. But by the way, we're not, you know, like deal with all that upfront cost, take that risk yourself. You know, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow. And, you know, I think some devs will swallow it either because they like the potential of Stadia or because they're already in development or because they have a title that they think might port well. You know, I, some people will take this up, but again, I think, Stadia needs a lot of developers to take it up with unique offerings and bold ideas. The article here mentions that some other subscription services offer a mix of upfront payment and then followed by this engagement-based revenue. It also says that a Google rep declined to specify whether upfront payments are part of this. So I'll take that as 
no, <laughs> there are no upfront payments. Um, uh, William, I, I want to. I'm curious what your what your crystal ball says on this. In that, will we see Stadia lose developers, like fundamentally? Yes, yes. I, I would say that, or rather, it will encourage like the sorts of developers that might. Well, I mean, let, yeah. There. Let's be like. Let me let me try to walk that back a little. Yes, I think a lot of developers that wanted to do a heavy investment game will back away from the platform because there's now more risk associated with that business model. I think developers who are looking maybe for more mobile games, and again, we don't know how rewarding this monetization model is on recurring, like maybe it's extremely competitive, the compensation on recurring engagement. And Google's actually being generous here and saying, no, you know what? Like we just want a certain type of game. But what this will do is encourage developers who want to make retention heavy games come to the platform. I think retention heavy games are mobile games. I, I think that's really what this is coded as, right? This is going to make more mobile type games come to the Stadia platform, faster to develop, check in loops, you know, all the things we associate with a mobile offering. Um, maybe, I mean, maybe that's a good direction for Stadia. Maybe that's how Stadia survives is kind of an exclusive, you know, mobile store that you can play on your TV. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly you seemed bullish on Apple Arcade, Paul, and maybe this moves this it feels more like an Apple Arcade -y type of developer incentive. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, keep in mind, Apple Arcade meets the first thing you mentioned, which is Apple has the 100 million or, or more, right? They have what, like 2 billion iPhones or something like, you know what I mean? Some massive number. They, like they have that user base. And so... I actually don't know what the Apple Arcade model is in the back end for the developers, but assuming it's engagement based, they at least can make that argument that you just made, which is, hey, you know, I'm bringing 100 million people to your game here, so put up with it kind of thing. Um, it's interesting. It'll be, you know, Stadia has continued to make some poor decisions, it seems. Um, I don't know if this is the nail in the coffin because I've now probably called a few things the nail in the coffin for Stadia. Um, I'm surprised Google is still making announcements for Stadia at all. Uh, um, I would have expected that to just sort of go away quietly. Uh, but, you know, they're, uh, they're out there. At least the PR people are working. Um, let's, um, let's move on. Let's talk about Tencent. Tencent in the news, guys. And, and the headline here, Tencent makes another European gaming move with $1.27 billion sumo bid. Uh, so basically, uh, Tencent has essentially made an offer to buy out um, all of the sort of the remaining shares it doesn't own of Sumo Group. Uh, for, for those who don't know, they've made Sackboy, Hotshot Racing, they're a public company listed in London. And uh, Tencent previously owned a 10% stake of the company. They're buying essentially the rest of the business now for $1.26 billion. We have said many times on this podcast that, you know, we were going to see more and more of these big game publishers get consolidated, being bought up. Any Is anyone surprised that this is Tencent buying yet another, like making a very large purchase? William, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Oh, sorry. This is no, this is no knock on Sumo, but I just like... Man, that Disney acquisition of Star Wars looks better and better. <laughs> How many like, Star Wars just, is this? <laughs> like, this is like half a Star Wars, three quarters of a Star Wars or something. Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, no knock on Sackboy and Little Big Planet. Like, those games are amazing. But like, wow, what a bargain Disney got. Um, I just think it's interesting. I mean, it shows you like, you know, I think we said on the podcast, we call it this is there's is not done. There's going to be tons of developers that are getting acquired. Pretty much anyone with scale and a degree of independence is going to get merged in um, to one of sort of the mega conglomerate blocks that are forming. Um, this is a great publisher with great games. Um, you know, is it worth one point two billion, William? You know, uh, is it worth because Codemasters was also bought for one point two billion? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Who yeah, who got the better crazy. deal here, EA or Tencent? Anyone have thoughts? I got to think about that for a second. Codemasters is all the grid games, all their racing engine games, correct? What else it's is Codemasters? Right. It's pretty much F1. I don't know I see. any other. Uh, yeah, I know they do grid and like all the like casual, like dirt. Um, 
I know they do all of those, but 1.2 billion for Codemasters? I mean, does it not speak to just how red hot the market is for these game developers? Like, there's just so much competition for these deals. There's probably, we can count on two hands, all the game developers left of this size or scale, right? Left to be bought. Yeah, and, and capital is cheap. Let's be honest, right? Like we have historically low interest rates. Like that's part of what's driving these asset purchases um, too, I believe. It's um, true. Sorry, yeah, what? It, it's tricky for me to say who got the better deal. I mean, they're both like, honestly, they're both great companies with really interesting IP portfolios. You know, my gut is I would say the Codemasters deal is a better deal um, because Codemasters feels more like you're owning a space. Right. Like with the Codemasters purchase, you are undoubtedly the preeminent driving like you have like you own the racing space. Right. Like right. there's a lot you can do with that. As great as Sackboy and Little Big Planet is, for example, it has a lot of competition with like Fall Guys being the most obvious, you know, but like that kind of general safe party play, you know, adventure world like it's a very good IP, but there's other IP that I would consider triple A in that space that compete with it. But and. In terms Again, of I mean, recency, mm -hmm. yeah. In terms of recency, I'm not particularly sure what Sumo has put out. Right, Little Big Planet is huge IP, I think, but I haven't particularly heard their name thrown around super recently for any huge releases. And I might be just completely wrong in that. Like, if you have any information on that end, let me know. But I don't know what they've done recently. You know, what What I like here in comparisons aside is just what this indicates for the industry, right? You have people, companies like Tencent that have previously invested in these areas that are now more than doubling down, right? That 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 are seeing not only the potential or the fruits of, of you know, their foresight, I suppose, from years ago, but, but like you said, not only are they going to keep acquiring more smaller studios, I think we're going to see a lot more growth in the space because what? of this. What was the Bethesda acquisition at again? Do you remember Paul or Jimmy or other Jimmy? Seven, like two Jimmy. Eight, bil eight billion, I think. So, I mean, another way to eight think billion? about this is 7.5, yeah. Another way to think about this is say like six Bethesdas, right? And that, <laughs> no, I mean, it's really interesting to like <laughs> size it. I like to like make, because the money is so large, like you lose all scale. Like I really like to chunk yeah. it up. You know, I if you put a Bethesda price on that, to be honest, I'd rather... I'd rather have the Beth I'd rather pay six times more and get a Bethesda than, you know, either of these businesses. Again, no knock on these businesses. I just think Bethesda has so much IP under it, which sort of reinforces what I think, which is the earlier you're buying in this market, the better you do. Right. Like this is the moment of set. And I guarantee you there's going to be another deal at like one point five billion. And we're going to be like or like two billion. We're going to be like, oh, you could have had two little big planets for that. That's crazy. <laughs> but it's just it is. This is a scarce asset. There's very few developers with owned IP that have persisted for enough time to show that they're more than a one hit wonder, right? Mm -hmm. And that have sort of scale and operations that they could actually fold into a commercial studio and presumably integrate well, right? Um, there just aren't that many left. And I think we're gonna see them all snatched up in the next two years. There's an analyst that was quoted in this article and I'll just, I'll read the quote. Um, before this though, I'll just say, like, I think part of it is also that Sumo is a public company and to be able to buy the shares of a public company, like you have to pay a premium to the public valuation. And that public valuation was already probably pretty rich. You add that premium on top, then you end up with a, you know, this is how you get to 1.2 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, but this analyst says in this article, quoted in this article says, Sumo is a rare asset in that it is, it is a pure play developer. To most publishers, it would be a very expensive way to bring on board a thousand experienced developers as it does not own any meaningful IP of its own. So they don't have a lot of IP, but they have a thousand developers. And, and the argument that, that the, this analyst goes on to make is that uh, essentially to the tech giant, I'll continue reading the, the quote, to the ch tech giants that are looking for content, e.g. Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, it would be a quick route to onboard a big studio, but a slow route to adding content to their platforms as development would take years and lots more capital. So they think it's a maybe a, a you know, 10 cents offer is rich and unlikely to attract counter bids, but it's maybe the only buyer that would pay this. If you do the math though, and you believe this number of a thousand experienced developers at 1.2 billion, they've, they've paid what? One, 1.2 million per developer. 
right? <laughs> My math correct here. <laughs> that's that's uh, it's expensive. I mean, it's it's not it's not cheap. Huh. Uh, yeah. You're paying 1.2 million per head, um, but you know uh, at least the feeling here is that ten cent is is maybe the right buyer, and I think I think that's probably true, right? Like ten cent seems to find a way to extract value from these things in ways that other other of other sort of the big players like Microsoft don't seem to, uh, and I, I don't know why. I don't know if you guys have thoughts there. Hmm. I, I, I don't know. Other than maybe Tencent, again, it all, all folding into their operations, right? Maybe Tencent has other. Again, maybe we're making a false assumption about the the you know what the IP ownership stake is in these you know in the company. I, I presume they owned like Little Big Planet and things. They must, right? But anyway, um, so it's kind of sad that the analyst is saying that's not great IP. <laughs> um, well, we don't but, well, um, actually we don't know, right? Like it know, may have yeah. been licensed from I don't yeah, know Sony, Sony or, or something. Yeah, yeah. right, right. But, um, but either way, just look at it as a thousand person <laughs> development shop. I mean, Tencent sure has a lot of great companies that they might want to plug a thousand developers ready to go into. You know what I mean? And I, I think the mistake that the analyst misses there is it's a slow route to content if you're developing a new game. But let's say you have a live service game that is difficult to sustain, right? True. Yeah, you're not going to get people out day one, but you don't have to wait three years for a game to bake. You can probably have the studio churning out content six months later. And this is becoming a live serve. Like the world we're entering now is becoming a live service driven world. You know, I wonder if Tencent doesn't look at this and say this is one of the only ways we can meet a live service pipeline yeah. or, you know, any number of 10 cent games that are live service based, which is basically yeah. all of them. And I, I think if they have any sort of like, I, what I think 10 cent is good at is fun, like experimenting with lesser known IPs and bringing them to different platforms. And honestly, what I think could be a long-term play here, William, you mentioned the, you know, games as a service thing here, like a live platform. What if they do create that, you know, we were talking about on another episode of the after, of the live show, rather, where it's like not an MMO, but it's a, an entirely online, always online connected platform for a more broad audience, right? Where you have more little big planet aesthetic, it's a little more appealing to a mass audience. Maybe there is some sort of thinking down that line, right? Like yeah. much more appealing for a broad audience, always connected, always online, and maybe a mobile port for those three things to connect. And so I think with those three things in mind, maybe they have a, a massive audience in China or maybe globally to advertise that to. And I think that there is something among those three pillars there. I mean, one last thought I have is maybe is, and William, this is just an extension of your point, which I thought was a really good one, is the evil master plan of Tencent just to corner the market on good game developers, right? Like literally it, control it, all the bodies. It, right? It's not, I mean, it's interesting to say, like, I don't know if it's possible to do, but it's <laughs> sort of not a bad plan. Like you're never going to corner the market on like team cherries, you know, like creative, <laughs> small two per person shops or whatever, you know, but you could corner the market on commercial studio developers because there just aren't that many that aren't owned mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. that, are, that are left. And, and it is a different, thing when you're doing commercial development at scale right and yeah that's interesting maybe tencent says you know what we think the biggest barrier to our title success versus other titles is actually the supply of developers in yeah. so we're gonna which is actually a thesis that might make sense to me and we so know we're Activision gonna be blizzard struggling there yeah yeah so we're gonna be smarter than everyone else and we're gonna start buying up that supply now so you know what it doesn't it almost doesn't matter how good our games are going to be in the future <laughs> We're one of the few companies that's going to have the talent infrastructure to sustain the games. And to Jimmy's point at the beginning of this podcast, consistency matters a lot <laughs> in gaming today, right? So Tencent's sort of saying here, we can be consistent. And if we buy enough of this stuff, our competitors may have trouble being consistent, which is a sure way to win. Wow, it's an interesting thought. I love, I I think it's such a good point. I want to end on that, guys. Um, Tencent's <laughs> master plan uh buy up all the game developers the all the human beings who make games um william as always thank you jimmy and jimmy thank you guys um for those of you who are fans of the podcast guys make sure to go leave that five star rating and review it really helps people other people find the podcast we also cover a bunch of other news on our weekly live show if you haven't come to that yet we do it every wednesday evening 8 30 p.m eastern time it's a lot of fun it's like the podcast, but it's interactive. It's a bigger cast. 
Uh, we cover all the all the stuff that we didn't get to on the podcast. And uh, we really encourage you to come, even if you're just lurking, but participating, also welcome. And uh, make sure to follow us everywhere. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you name it. And go leave a review. Book of Esports on Amazon. Show William some love. It's a great book. If you haven't read it yet, pick it up. Uh, and leave that five-star review on Amazon. I know you will love it. As always, guys, thank you so much, and we will see you next week.